I had managed to keep a healthy skepticism of ghosts, ghouls, and all things supernatural until I was 28. I found most claims of such things to be dubious at best and harmful at worst. I was very much in the camp of classical sciences as I had studied physics at the University of Edinburgh several years earlier. While my profession has never taken me back into the scientific arena, I had until this time maintained a ruthless opposition to pseudoscience and superstition. My friends often wonder about the change they saw in me at that time. What surprised them was that it wasn't a slow, steady change of heart, but rather a complete turnaround overnight. A transformation, if you will. It may have appeared as if it occurred so very quickly, but in fact, it happened over a slightly longer time scale. Two weeks to be precise. It was February, in fact. It was the week of Valentine's Day. Around this time, I was going through a socially isolated phase. It's something which often happens in the bleak Scottish winters where I become increasingly wrapped up in my own loneliness and passing bitterness at those who fit in. It was, and still is, a neurotic hangover from my teenage years, one which has plagued me for far too long. Two weeks earlier, I had found myself wandering through the cobbled streets of Edinburgh to clear my head. Walking, as amusing as it may seem, has always been a great comfort to me. You are, in every sense, alone with your thoughts. But that part of you which craves the company of others is slightly appeased by being in the world, even if you're only in it long enough to share a glance with a passing stranger. Edinburgh is a very old city and has remarkably kept much of its former self cobbled streets meander down the steep side of what was once a volcano, breaking off sporadically into narrow lanes, which occasionally open up into secluded courtyards. These numerous courtyards are often flanked on all sides by tall terraced houses, huddled together as if whispering of a secret and long-forgotten past. The impressiveness of Edinburgh as a city is often lost on those who have lived there long enough to find beauty commonplace. As often happens when gripped by depression, I hadn't been sleeping well. I had finished work the previous evening around 5 p.m., and while I managed to get a few hours of sleep, my mind just wouldn't let me relax. Come six in the morning, even though it was a Sunday, and I could for once have a long lie conceded defeat in my attempts to have a proper rest and got up to greet the world, however reluctantly. By the time I had set out, it was still early morning, and the cold January air stung my face. Although Edinburgh is, for want of a better expression, a tourist city, at that time it still seemed relatively deserted, even for a Sunday. A slight mist had risen out of the water of Leith, making it feel all the more colder as I passed through the narrow lanes and down empty pavements, entirely oblivious to where I was going. As the shops opened and the first trickle of tourists bled out onto the cobbled walkways from their hotels, I deliberately headed for a quieter, often forgotten network of streets my wandering mind had indeed taken over. For as I broke through the haze of a daydream, I found myself standing at the gates of an old graveyard. I had been thinking of turning back and heading home, but something about this place awoke a compulsion in me. I had to explore it. I found it curious that the gates, constructed out of blackened steel rods, were lying unlocked as early in the day as this. Entering the cemetery, I immediately noticed the overall isolation of the place, enjoying
following the sound of gravel under my feet, which pierced the silence as I moved slowly along a path littered with small white stones. It wasn't a large graveyard. It seemed to consist of two separate plots, with the older graves at the front bordering the forested edge. Someone you adore, the first feeling of being loved, the first kiss. I had, in fact, hardly ever spoken to her until only a few weeks before she died. In one of those embarrassing maneuvers, which teachers often pull, the pupils were all forcefully partnered with someone to take to our first social dance. Social dancing was a torrid affair. For someone like Lisa, it was fun and to be enjoyed. While for me, it was something to be detested. I was embarrassed, possessing none of the talent to be a dancer, and even more so afraid to spend time with a girl held back by my own teenage awkwardness. It was the end of January, and Lisa quickly set me at ease in social dancing class where we practiced. I cannot convey the simultaneous sense of joy and fear which I felt when she asked me to walk her home that day. Some people find social interactions to be exhausting, much like myself, always worried about saying the wrong thing but some individuals can set others at ease with the smallest of efforts. Lisa was one of those people. As we walked across an elegantly Victorian bridge towards her house, the winter sun bathed our surroundings in a cool, comforting glow. I couldn't have been more content to be in the presence of this happy, kind-hearted girl. She was so beautiful an incredible smile and golden locks of hair, which seemed more at home in a fairy tale than our surroundings. For weeks, we walked the same route home every day, talking, laughing, something I rarely did, and growing ever closer. When you are that age, everything is so potent. Most can fall in and out of love in a heartbeat. I didn't have many friends. I lived alone with my mother, who was not a particularly affectionate woman. So in that short time, I fell in love with Lisa Maine. On the 13th of February, we stopped outside her house. We stood talking for a moment. And then, for the first time, Lisa became distant. She stared straight at me in a way that she had never done before. I felt uneasy yet exhilarated. There was a moment, a tiny moment, where we said nothing to one another. Then she hugged me. Her fingers slid through my hair. I will never forget how sweet she smelled, how alive she felt, and how grateful I was to someone for showing me a kindness I had never previously known. Lisa slowly let go of me and then skipped up to her front door. Just before she disappeared, she turned and smiled at me one more time. Then she was gone. Immediately, I knew what I was going to do. For the first time in my life, I was full of purpose and focus. A desire to do just one thing. I ran as fast as I could to the local shops. I was lucky as most of them were shutting up for the day. A kind old man who ran a rarely used card store allowed me into his shop even though he was just closing. I was going to buy my first Valentine's card. It had to be perfect. It had to be just right. After looking at almost every card I could afford, I found one. It was fate. The card was red with a white circle in the middle. In that circle was a boy and girl walking hand in hand into the distance, together. I did not care what it said inside, because I have always had a way with the written word, and knew I could put something down which came from the heart. I bought it. After leaving the card shop, I went straight into my local newsagents. I had kept aside my last two pounds. My mother gave me an allowance to buy my lunch at school every week, and I knew she would not give me more should I spend it. 
despite it meaning I would have to go without lunch for a few days. I bought a box of chocolates to accompany the card. I rushed home, walked straight past my mother, who barely greeted me, grabbed a pair of scissors from the kitchen, and went upstairs. I knew I would get into an unbelievable amount of trouble for it, but I didn't care. I cut a sliver of material from the red curtains hanging in my mother's room and tied a makeshift ribbon around the box of chocolates. In my mind, it now looked like a Valentine's gift. I wrote in the card explaining how I felt about Lisa and how much those walks home had meant to me. Signed it, sealed the envelope, and slid it under the ribbon so it sat nicely with the chocolates. I waited for the next day. It came all too slowly. The 14th of February. I will never forget the excitement of getting ready for school. I took one last look at the chocolates and card before slipping them into my bag. I think I made it a little too obvious that I was carrying something important and delicate. As I cradled the whole bag in my arms for most of the day, I was so enthused, so focused, that I was going to march straight up to Lisa and give her the gift without a care for what the others, some of whom could be very cruel, would think she was not there. She wasn't in the playgrounds. She wasn't in her classes. For the subjects we shared, I just sat and stared at her empty desk and chair. School finished, and I found myself walking the same route Lisa and I would normally. I stood outside her house, holding the chocolates. I can't describe the feeling I experienced there. Call it the effects of a lack of food, or the exhaustion of having been so primed for the day. But anxiety took me, and as a result, I couldn't bring myself to knock on her door. I went home, dejected. I couldn't so much as eat a bite of the undercooked ham my mother threw down in front of me. So I simply went upstairs and crawled into bed, barely sleeping all night. For the next two days, I walked that same route and found myself holding on to those chocolates, not daring to cross the threshold of the little white fence in front of Lisa's house. On the third day, I asked our teachers about Lisa's absence, something which just hadn't occurred to me to do. I associated any authority with being cold, distant, and unfair. And as a result, normally avoided contact with my teachers at any cost. Mr. Randall, our history teacher, was just what I did. I knocked and knocked and knocked, but no one answered. The next day, I did the same, and again, no one answered. It had now been five days since I had last seen Lisa. It was a Saturday, and once again, I went over to Lisa's house, chocolates, and card in hand. As I approached her house, the sky clouded over, casting a dull hue over Lisa's seemingly deserted street. It was clear to see that Lisa's father was not a gardener. The garden path split an overgrown and patchy lawn in two, with clambering weeds stretching up towards the sun through numerous cracks in the concrete slabs. I stopped to look around and focused my gaze on what seemed to be a smallish gnome figurine smothered in the undergrowth. It had sadly been broken. Many suggest that when something is wrong, a person knows. They may not be aware of precisely what has happened, but that they can almost feel a palpable sense of dread in the air. I looked around and continued towards the front door Something was different. I was sure that the house had seemed as deserted as it had on the previous days I had visited. And while the house was for all intents and purposes exactly the same as before, there was one change. The front door was open. I was convinced that it had been shut when I had arrived. But I dismissed this 
as simply the byproduct of my fascination with the condition of Lisa's garden. You see, I can't quite explain it, but there was something suffocating about that house on that quiet street. I reached the door and grasped the door knocker, chapping three times. No answer. I repeated my knocks more forcefully this time, but still no one came. The door was only slightly ajar, and as such, I couldn't really see much of the interior. All I could tell was that the house was dark, and that the air escaping through the doorway was musty, as if nothing had stirred inside for days. I started to feel nervous. I didn't really know why. Clearing my throat and stammering slightly, I asked hello. Several times without answer, the street was empty, and the whole place felt devoid of life. Then a thought began to ruminate and gather momentum within me. What if Lisa and her father were hurt? I started to play out all of the possibilities in my mind. The two of them lying somewhere in the house, injured without food or water for days. Then I remembered that my history teacher had said Lisa was ill. He must have spoken to someone to know this, probably Lisa's father. I hoped that she was not so sick that her father had taken her to the hospital. Despite the logic of my thoughts, I still could not dismiss the horrible feeling that something was indeed wrong. Fear began to grip me, yet I closed my eyes only for a moment and found the memory of Lisa's embrace, all the solace I needed to overcome it. I held on tightly to the card and chocolates as I pushed the door fully open. It moved silently, but I was sure the noise of it hitting a doorstop on the floor would alert anyone to my presence as the bang echoed throughout the house, but still no one came. The house was bathed in darkness. I took one last look around me and crossed the threshold. While Lisa did not come from an affluent family, the house had an upstairs and must have had at least four bedrooms with an attic. Perhaps the fact that Lisa was an only child made the house seem all the larger or emptier but as I slowly made my way down the hallway, I felt as if each footstep echoed throughout distant passages and rooms, beginning with the living room on the ground floor. I moved from room to room, occasionally asking if anyone could hear me, but I quickly became aware that I was only talking to myself. The air was stiflingly hot, and running my hand across a radiator, I realized that the boiler must have been on for some time. As I moved into the kitchen at the rear of the house, I heard something. It was an almost rhythmic, dull thudding. I couldn't identify what it was, but I knew it was coming from somewhere upstairs. I left the kitchen, which I was glad to do as it was filled with the smell of rotting food, and walked to the foot of the stairs. The staircase was quite narrow and ran along the inside of a wall. At the top of the stairs was a landing which curved round to the left and led onto the other rooms. The dull thudding was now more pronounced, and as I slowly climbed the stairs, the same fear which had gripped me at the door returned. The realization of wandering into someone's house uninvited came to the fore. Stopping for a moment, I closed my eyes and thought of Lisa again. I continued on. As I reached the top of the stairs, the thudding noise stopped. I shudder now, even just thinking of it. There were three doors leading to the other bedrooms, and one leading to a bathroom, which I could already see was empty. The door to the first bedroom lay open, I peered in slowly, almost expecting to find someone there. There was no one. It was Lisa's father's room, neat, organized, with almost no objects of any note. The only curiosity was that the curtains were not drawn. The door to 
until the second room was closed. Again, I was overcome with a sense of intrusion. I was walking around inside someone's house without invitation. In effect, I was a trespasser. I knocked on the door quietly, waiting for a moment. I realized the room must be empty and turned the brass handle on the door. It opened. As I pushed the door, it creaked and then suddenly stopped after only a few inches of movement. Something was behind the door. I pulled it towards me and then pushed again, but no luck. With each attempt, the wooden door bashed off of something. I suddenly became aware of the noise I was making as each attempt echoed throughout the house. It was not dissimilar to the thudding I had heard before. I tried one more time, pushing against the obstacle as hard as I could. No luck. I was about to give up and move on to the next door when I saw what was blocking my entrance. I will never forget the cold, glassy stare of the face, which seemed to be peeking out from behind the bottom of the door skin a pallid gray, a few retreating locks of hair covering an otherwise balding head, globules of sweat congealed under. Most of its features were obscured by the door, but the only visible eye still stared, clouded and covered in shadow. I didn't scream because I quickly realized that not only was this the face of Lisa's father, he was very much dead. I felt numb, but looking back, I realize I handled the situation much more calmly than many of my age would have. But then, I did have a strange fascination for such things, reading many accounts of quite horrific death scenes. I stared for a moment, composed myself, and then instantly turned to thoughts of Lisa and where she might be. Was she in the same room? Was she in the attic? All I could hope for was that she was okay. Something then happened, an event which I have. Daughter could come back to life and attack me seemed absurd and impossible. Yet, there remains a lingering doubt, a nagging uncertainty that refuses to be silenced. Perhaps it is the unease of the unknown, the lingering fear of the supernatural, or simply the mind's struggle to reconcile the horrors it witnessed with the rational explanations it seeks. To this day, I carry the weight of that night with me, haunted by the memory of Lisa's tragic fate and the ghastly specter that emerged from the darkness. It is a burden I bear alone. For who would believe such a tale? Who could comprehend the terror that still grips my soul? And so, I keep my silence, burying the truth beneath layers of denial and repression. Yet, in the quiet hours of the night, when sleep eludes me and shadows dance upon the walls, I cannot escape the chilling realization that some horrors defy explanation, and that the line between the living and the dead is far thinner than we dare to imagine. Guilt and regret would overwhelm me once I faced her final resting place. Nevertheless, I pressed on, driven by a sense of duty and a desperate need to somehow make amends for my perceived failure to act when she needed me most. As I approached her grave, a wave of emotions washed over me, threatening to engulf my already fragile composure. I knelt down beside the weathered headstone, tracing the engraved letters of her name with trembling fingers. Lisa Main, it read a stark reminder of the life that had been extinguished far too soon. With a heavy heart, I placed the box of chocolates and the long-forgotten Valentine's card upon the soft earth, my hands lingering for a moment as if seeking solace from the cold stone beneath them. Tears welled in my eyes as I whispered words of apology. 
hoping against hope that somehow, somewhere, she would hear me and forgive my shortcomings. In that quiet corner of the graveyard, amidst the whispering winds and the rustling leaves, I made a vow to honor Lisa's memory for as long as I lived, though I could never change the past or undo the tragedies that had befallen her. I could strive to live a life worthy of the love she had once bestowed upon me, however fleetingly. As I rose to leave, a sense of peace washed over me, as if a weight had been lifted from my shoulders. In that moment, I knew that though Lisa may be gone, her spirit would live on in the hearts of those who had known and loved her. And so, with one last lingering glance at her grave, I turned away, the echoes of the past fading into the gentle embrace of the present, though the scars of that fateful day would always remain. I found solace in the knowledge that love, in all its forms, has the power to transcend even the darkest of shadows.